those as well. And uh, say a word of welcome if there by chance be somebody watching my live stream today, maybe for the first time. Glad to have you with us. My name is David Ford, I'm a pastor here at Mission Charlottesville. Glad to have you join us this morning. And uh, possibly there will be those who will catch this by video later. We welcome you as well. And uh, if you'd like to learn about, more about Mission Charlottesville, you can visit our website, missioncharlottesville.org. You can learn some things that way. And we invite you to follow us on Facebook. You'll learn some things there as well. If you'd like to reach me by email, you can do that at missioncharlottesville at gmail.com. And uh, for those who watch by live stream, uh, some of you uh, watch very faithfully, and we appreciate you so much. Um, if you would care to support us by financially to support the work of the kingdom of God in through Mission Charlottesville, financially you can do that through our website and uh, go there and look for the Give tab and click there and it'll give you the instructions to follow. So we invite you to do that. Uh, also, we'd like to just invite anybody who watches by live stream uh, once a month in the life of Mission Charlottesville, we have what we call our Discipleship Development Class. Normally that happens on the first Monday of each month, starting at 6.30 p.m. You're invited to be a part of that, no matter where you live. And uh, if you would like to be part of that, you can send me an email, and I'll send you a Zoom link, and you can uh, tune in to that and be a part of that as well. So please know you're invited to do so. Now, this uh, invite here is for regulars who uh, attend here at Mission Charlottesville. Uh, we are in need of help in terms of volunteers to help with set up teardown. We're looking for one to two people on Team A or in one to two people for Team D. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we invite you to uh, catch me after service. I'll be glad to talk with you about that. I encourage you to read the other announcements that are in our bulletin right now. And uh, that's all that I have to say by way of announcement this morning. So let's uh, prepare our hearts to praise our God. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's stand and we're going to get started with Open Up the Heavens.
Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Amen. Now let's pray together right now, shall we? Gracious Lord, we come to you this day, and indeed, Lord, we declare that you are the God of our salvation. Lord, that apart from you, we have none. And so, Lord, this day, we thank you. We thank you for life itself. And we thank you for our great salvation in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In his name, Lord, we have gathered this day. I declare that on behalf of us here in this place, I declare that on behalf of those watching my live stream, wherever they may be, that we gather today in your name, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this time. Give all of us grace for this day to worship you in spirit and in truth. For we dedicate, Lord, this service in ourselves to you. We give ourselves away, Lord, to you because you gave yourself away for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to release folks that they're going to be going to Children's Church. Um, and uh, if not, we welcome you to stay with us. And uh, today, um, before we have a kind of morning prayer, I uh, have a brief video I invite you to watch this morning. And um, you may need to put your thinking on cap on just a little bit as you listen to this uh, New Testament scholar. Uh, he talks in this about uh, what our bodies will be like in the in the world and age to come. And uh, it actually does tie in today with the message uh, where I talk about the greatness of our salvation in our future glorification. So this is Dr. Ben Witherington on the video, so give him a listen, okay? If you study those kinds of adjectives that end with the in ending, they do not refer to the quality of yeah. the body that is being talked about. They are referring to the source of power that energizes the body. So a Sukikon Soma is a Soma that is merely empowered by life breath, that is kept alive by life breath. That's what the Suke is. It doesn't mean soul, it just means natural life breath. But a spiritual body, by contrast with that, is a body that is totally empowered and enlivened and vivified by the Spirit of God. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that when Christ returns and the dead in Christ are raised, they will have a body that is immune to disease, decay, and death, a physical body, immune to suffering, sin, and sorrow. He says it will be immortal, it will be imperishable, it will be powerful and it will be glorious. But what he also says is it will be totally empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul means by a spiritual body. Not a body made out of spirit, but a body totally empowered by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> what Paul believes is we will become what we admire. Christ's history is our destiny. And so just as Jesus was raised from the dead in the flesh and was tangible and could eat with his disciples and do other bodily things, so when Christ returns, those in Christ will be raised and conform to his image in the resurrection body. We are, in fact, the Eastern people. Victor to come right now. And Victor is going to offer up our morning prayer this morning. So, Wayne, if you play some simmering music for us, and uh, we'll have a brief time of silent prayer, and then Victor will offer up our morning prayer this morning. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, let's pray, shall we? Before we go into our silent prayer, I want to do pray in this prayer. This was something I believe the Lord has for someone or maybe more. Um, some of us may be going through 
a lot of battles and things like that and we feel a little beat up. And I think this is the prayer that the Lord led you to as far as to show us that we do have the victory in Him and that He is fighting for us. So let's pray silently for a little while and I'll lead us in prayer. Help us today to be full of faith 
and full of the Holy Spirit. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight or emotions. In the Spirit and not in the flesh. Help us to trust you, to rest joyfully in you, to be settled, surrendered, and submitted to you. To be always persevering and confident in you and discerning. Because the battle is, our, is also for our minds, Father, we put on the helmet of salvation and we submit our mind and thoughts to you, Lord. Give us the mind of Christ, not a carnal mind. Let our thoughts be your thoughts. We declare today that our minds are off limits and impenetrable by the devil. And now we take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we ask you to help us to speak your word with all boldness, authority, and power quickly against the devil. In the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, we clothe ourselves with humility, with love and compassion, with kindness and gentleness, with patience and self-control, with holiness and purity, and with forgiveness. Yeah. Help us to always walk this way before you and man today. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This we go to the next slide because I'll be reading the, uh, the scripture as well today. So I'll be reading three different passages. Thank you, Wayne. I'll be reading out of three uh, different passages. The first one will be out of Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. And it says, What then? Should we, because we are not under law, put under grace? But by no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, with, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the, to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of, your, of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from things of which you are now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The next passage will be out of 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment that we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The last passage would be out of 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See what love the Father hath given us, that we should be called children of God, and that as we are, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. We will be, I'm sorry, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves, just as He is pure. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Speak of God.
Thank you. Okay. Well, here we go. Would you uh, please pray for me, and I'll pray for all of us as we uh, come to this message right now. Lord, thank you for this time, this opportunity again, Lord, to stand here, Lord, for your glory, Lord, for the good of your people, Lord, to preach and teach your word. I pray, come Holy Spirit, fresh anointing upon all of us, upon me, Lord, let my words be ordered of you, anointed of you, and used by you in all of our lives. Lord, I pray right now that you would break through. Lord, that your presence would envelop us. We would hear something today, Lord, that we need to hear. Something that would encourage us. Build us up. Even challenge us. Lord, if need be, convict us. Lord, above all, Lord, don't leave us alone. Don't leave us alone. May we hear from you this day, in and through your word, by your spirit. And I pray today, Lord, that what I say, Lord, if in any way I've missed what you would have to be said, then I pray you commune directly with the spirits of your people this day. But above all, Lord, that we would hear you. We dedicate now this message in the name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. Back in the 19th century, America and Spain had a war. We call it the Spanish-American War. As a result of that war, uh, America helped free what is we know as Cuba today from Spanish rule. And during that war, a woman by the name of Clara Barton, who was the founder of the American Red Cross, she was there overseeing the work of the Red Cross in Cuba. And you might remember from your high school history classes that uh, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, who would one day go on to be President Theodore Roosevelt, that he was there uh, fighting in that fight with those he, that were called Rough Riders. And the story goes that he needed food for his sick and wounded riders. And went to Clara Barton and offered to buy these things from her and she refused. Well, he was taken back. He was perplexed by this. Kind of like, aren't we all on the same team here? And it was obvious his men needed the help, and he was prepared to pay out of his own funds. When he asked why he couldn't buy the supplies, somebody looked at him and said, Colonel, just ask for it. <laughs> a big smile broke out over his face, and he understood that the provisions were not for sale. All he needed to do was ask, and they would be given freely. That's the story. The same is true of salvation, isn't it? Our great salvation in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Salvation is freely given to those who ask by faith and with repentance. So I share that story to introduce this morning's message as we continue in this series of messages entitled The Greatness of Salvation in Christ. And today's message is entitled The Greatness of Salvation, Sanctification, and glorification. Now, for anybody that maybe is tuning in for the first time or dropping in to hear this message for the first time, I'm doing these uh, series of messages to unpack some of the spiritual blessings that are ours that come to us through our great salvation in Christ. Uh, I've said before, say it again, this series will not be exhaustive of all of those spiritual blessings that we have been blessed with, but it's certainly going to touch on some big ones some that are ours now and some that are to come. And so whether we have them now or later, they are ours in Christ, provided that we continue in believing loyalty to our God and Savior until the end. Now, the blessings that remain to be touched upon in this series after today are these. Here they are. The presence of the Spirit, 
the personality and power of the Spirit. We'll touch on those next Sunday. The kingdom of God, eternal life, hope of heaven, resurrection of the dead, reign with Christ, new heavens and earth, and the everlasting age. Awesome things, aren't they? A great saint once said this, and I quote, Our future is as bright as the promises of God. Isn't that a great quote? And this series certainly echoes that truth. Last Sunday we concentrated on the greatness of salvation that is revealed through justification and regeneration. Today we focus on the greatness of salvation as it relates to sanctification and glorification. One is for now, one is for later, right? But they are coming. And that brings me to say this. The greatness of our salvation in Christ gives us assurance of entire sanctification and perfection in love in this lifetime. Okay? Now, that statement might ring some bells with you, and uh, I'll explain that in just a moment. In making the case for what I just said, I turn to the book of Romans, chapter 6. And you'll notice that when Victor read the scripture this morning, the word sanctification appeared more than once, right? Romans chapter 6 helps make the case for the teaching or the doctrine of entire sanctification in this lifetime. As well as there are other passages that could have been read that make the same point. Paul the Apostle wrote this in Romans 6, 22 A and B. Hear it one more time. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. Now, back at the beginning of this year, I did a series of messages uh, dedicated to this Doctrine, this teaching of entire sanctification in this lifetime. I did it in conjunction with Dr. Kevin Watson's book entitled Perfect Love. And that series was entitled Going on to Perfection, Being Perfected in Love. So in that series, uh, I do what I do right now. Uh, I address the understandable concern that is expressed when it is asserted that by the grace, power, and truth of God, we can know entire sanctification in this lifetime. When I first heard this teaching, and just let you know, I grew up in a church, I never heard that taught. I never heard that taught. I remember the first time I heard that, I reflexively hit the brake and said, Whoa, in this lifetime, of course, I didn't understand what I hit the brake for. And it, it, it can be a challenging thing. And it's easy to dismiss it out of hand, but I'm telling you, Scripture doesn't. I quote uh, Dr. Timothy Tennant again here, because he says something that is so helpful at this point. Quote it one more time. The language of entire sanctification uses the word entire in reference to Greek, not Latin. In Greek, entire or complete can still be improved upon. Right? It doesn't make sense in English, but it does in Greek. I know what you're thinking right now. It's all Greek to me, David. Right? And so I say to us, if any of us are tempted to dismiss this out of hand, allow me to point this out. In the original Greek of Romans 6.22, that the providence of God led Paul to write him. He said this, right? But now that you have been freed from sin, the word free is obviously what figure of speech? It's a verb. It's a verb. Thank you very much. It's a verb. You've heard me talk about this before, I'll say it one more time. That verb was written in the aorist tense. We don't have an aorist tense in English, but they did in Greek. 
And when you read it, it sounds like the past tense. It's not the past tense. It's the heiress tense. And it means this. Something done at a certain point that has enduring effects into the present. Boom! It's done. And what's been done? We have been freed from sin. Do you believe that? Do you believe your Bible? We have been freed from sin. Now that's either true or it isn't. Because of the greatness of salvation is in Christ, not only are we forgiven of sin, but we have been freed from sin. We do not have to go on living lives dominated by sin. And by our great salvation in Christ, sin can become the exception in our lives and not the rule. Amen? Not the rule. Dr. Ben Witherton, who we saw a moment ago, right on the screen, uh, that brief uh, video, a New Testament scholar. He is the only New Testament scholar in the Wesleyan Methodist tradition that has written a commentary on every book of the New Testament. He's the only one. Isn't that interesting? He wrote the following in his commentary on the book of Romans on verse 22 of chapter 6, the following, I quote, Sanctification is seen here as the intermediate condition between what was true of believers before they were converted and what will be true of believers at the resurrection where they will inherit eternal life. Sanctification is then something that is supposed to lead to eternal life, not merely happen when one obtains eternal life, just as iniquity in this life leads to death. Holiness of heart and life is what God expects, indeed requires of His people. When one becomes a slave of God, a slave who obeys God's call and will, the process of sanctification, of cleansing, has begun in that human life. It is something that must continue as the believer continually must submit his faculties to be used in a right and righteous manner. One must present oneself to God as a living sacrifice daily. The promise given here is that believers have been freed from the bondage to sin, but freed for service and obedience to God, end quote. Now, don't let the terminology, a slave of God, throw you off, okay? I mean, is there something within us, particularly as Americans, we detest that word slave, don't we? We detest it. We're opposed to it. And we should be opposed to it when it means somebody being a slave of another human being. Obviously, that's contrary to the will of God. But here's the thing. Paul uses it. When it says a slave, a slave, the Greek word there is doulos. Doulos. It can also be translated a servant of God. But I think slave is the correct translation in this, in this uh, context. And here's why. Because if one gives oneself to sin, they will become the doulos of sin. They will become slave to it. Amen? Slavery to sin leads to greater and greater bondage, but slavery to God leads to greater and greater freedom. Amen? Amen. To be who God created us to be. And that is to be a human being in right relationship with God who is loving and holy so that we might rightly give expression to the image of God by also being loving and holy. It leads to freedom, not bondage. The term sanctification, here it is. It, 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 it is it's pronounced like this, hagios. That's what Paul wrote, hagios. It means holy. That's what it means, holy. Just as justifying grace can be received in a moment, sanctifying grace leading to an entire sanctification can as well. How did we receive justifying grace? By faith. How do we receive sanctifying grace? By faith. But here's the point. While you can receive it in a moment, guarding it in our lives is a process, isn't it? Oh, yes it is. 
And that's a daily reality, right? Um, so sanctification is both instantaneous and a process. It's both. Now to show the importance of this in the Bible, look at this. In the New Revised Standard Version, if you look for these words, here's what you'll find. The word sanctification, uh, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Old Testament. It appears five times in the New Testament. Next slide, please. Thank you. The word sanctify appears in the Old Testament 28 times, five times in the New Testament. The word sanctifying appears one time in the Old Testament, doesn't appear anywhere in the New Testament. And the word sanctified appears 14 times in the Old Testament, 13 times in the New Testament. It's sprinkled throughout the Bible. And so, in light of that, Dr. Kevin Watson, he wrote this book, and he, he wrote it uh, on this very subject. And there he clarifies what entire sanctification is not and what it is. Here's what it is not. Those who walk in that state of grace, they are not perfect in knowledge or free from ignorance. They are not free from mistakes. As the book of James says, we make many mistakes. Amen. They are not free from infirmities. They are not wholly free from temptation. And they are not free from the need for further growth. Here's what it is. It means that one lives a life of love excluding sin. Entire sanctification means that quote, all real Christians or believers in Christ are made free from outward sin. And entire sanctification means a purification of heart by faith. Now, none of the gifted anointed scholars that I have quoted, nor myself, are saying that that entire sanctification means that uh, that it becomes impossible for somebody to sin. Oh yeah, they can. <laughs> they can. Or that they will never again sin. That's not the point. The point is that we can walk in a state of grace where we can walk in victory over sin instead of in defeat. I remember I was talking to a guy one time. And uh, I think he was being humble and honest. And he, he made this statement as, as we were talking. He said, well, you know, I sin every day. And a thought just popped in my mind, came right out of my mouth. I said, uh, do you have a choice? Do you have to? Not according to Romans chapter 6. Huh? We have been freed from sin. We do have a choice by the grace, truth, and power of God. Amen? But I'm telling you, without that, we're going to sin. But by the grace, truth, and power of God in Christ, beloved, we don't have to go on living lives dominated by it. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Yes. Now, let me tell you something, my friends. It, this, this message has gotten lost. It's gotten lost in the modern church. And I'm telling you, somebody needs to be preaching and teaching the doctrine of sanctification. Right? Quote Dr. Tennant one more time. It says a sanctified person is caught up into a higher frame of reference in which the heart has been reoriented. It is what John Wesley once called a, quote, self-forgetful heart and a life engulfed by, here it is, perfect love. Another understanding of entire sanctification is the term being perfected in love. Here's why Victor read John 1 John chapter 4. Here it is. Here, here what the Apostle John write, wrote. Love, in fact, would you read this with me, please? Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness on the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Did John believe we could be perfected in love in this lifetime? Yes, he did. It is the Word of God. The opening phrase, love has been perfected. Well, the word perfected there, guess what tense that word is written in? What, what, what would you think it's written in? It's in the perfect tense. It's in the perfect tense. And what does that mean? If something's in the perfect tense, that means what? Completed action. That's what it means. If it was imperfect, it would mean uh, something in process. Perfect tense means completed action. We love has been perfected in us. It made perfect in love. John's making very clear that we can be perfected in love in this lifetime to obey the royal command of Jesus. And what was the royal command of Jesus? John recorded it in his gospel. John chapter 13, verse 34. Here it is. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. That's the royal command of Jesus. Now I've got a question. Was that a command or a suggestion? If it's a command. Follow the logic. Did Jesus love with perfect love? Yes. Huh? Yes, he did. Love was perfected in him. And yet Jesus said, you're to love as I loved. If it were not possible for us to be perfected in love in this lifetime, to love just as Jesus loved, then why did Jesus give that demand to his disciples for all generations? He gave it because he knew it was possible, because he knew the greatness of the salvation he was going to be giving to us. I cannot love that way unless the source of that love lives within me. But he does. Amen. And he lives in you as well. And my friends, we can be perfected in love in this lifetime. But we've got to guard it, don't we? And we have to be obedient to it. And that means even loving our enemies. Amen. Because he commanded that too. Hmm. So here's what I say. Ask and you shall receive. Ask and you shall receive. That brings me to this closing point. The greatness of our salvation in Christ not only gives us assurance of sanctification and perfection in love, but it also gives us assurance of glorification at the return of Christ. Oh, here's John one more time. Beloved. He, he likes that word, beloved. <laughs> Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And all have this, who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Now, in verse 2, when John wrote those inspired words, when he is revealed, we will be like him, we will see him as he is. The word there, revealed, it is, it is the word phanerothe. It can also be translated appears. When he is revealed or when he appears. So obviously it's talking about what? The second coming of Jesus. Amen. The end of the age. When Jesus comes again, his disciples that held to a believing loyalty to the end, they will experience glorifying grace. Amen? Tennant put it this way. Listen to this quote. 
after justification, we are free from the penalty of sin. Through sanctification, we are free from the power of sin. At glorification, we are free from the very presence of sin. Ha! I'm telling you, it's going to be awesome to be a saint of God that day. I mean, if you're out of the influence of, of being away from the world, the flesh, and the devil, just think how easy it's going to be to be a saint of God. Amen? Uh, in this, this commentary, when John says we will be like him, it does not mean that we will have taken on the nature of God himself. We will always be created beings, totally dependent upon His life for our existence. But we will be like Him in the sense that what that we share more and more in His holiness, purity, and joy. We will be like Jesus inside and out. Uh, our great salvation in Christ, it is a process. Begun by justifying grace, sustained by sanctifying grace, completed by glorifying grace at the return of Christ. And what are we going to get? Just like Dr. Witherington said, we're going to have a glorious body. We're going to have a glorious body. As surely as Christ came the first time, He will come the second and the last time. C.S. Lewis wrote about this awesome event like this. Listen to these words. When the author walks on the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade. All right. Something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time, it will be God without disguise. It will be too late then to choose your side. When Christ returns, please hear me, the trajectory of each life will be revealed. Those who are on the journey of sanctifying grace will come suddenly to glorifying grace and with Christ forever. And those who have rejected the saving grace of Christ will continue on their trajectory away from Him forever. So I say to all who hear this message this day, what is the trajectory of your life? Is it toward Christ and eternal life or away from Christ? The decision is ours. I want to invite you to stand please. Praise man, would you please come? This morning, if you're here today and you're in need of prayer, our friend Victor Clun will make himself available to pray with you. If you want prayer for sanctifying grace, Victor will pray for that. Or anything else you might want prayer for, you come as we sing. Oh,